Today, my guest is Lane Kawaoka. Lane is an engineer turned real estate investor, and he's the host of the podcast, Simple Passive Cashflow. He's um, also now in uh, multifamily. Uh, he started out in single family. We're going to get into that here in just a little bit. And he's also, I should uh, point out, he was a returning, he is a returning guest. He was on uh, CREP and radio, another uh, earlier episode, and I'll list that in the show notes. I'll have to look that up. Um, but we are going to uh, talk about uh, raising uh, capital, uh, fundraising for uh, multifamily. Uh, but before we do that, just a quick reminder, if you like the show, we would love to hear from you. You can uh, send us a, a comment, you can like, you can share the show, or you can subscribe. Also want to remind you that if you'd like to watch the show, it's available on, on uh, YouTube. You can check out our channel, it's Commercial Real Estate Pro Network and uh, see how, how we all look and take a look at us. So with that, I want to welcome my guest, Lane Kawaoka. Lane, how you doing? Hey, thanks for having me, Darren. Oh, welcome back to CREPN Radio. Um, I think the last time we talked, you were in a, an empty apartment that was all boxed up, and uh, oh, yeah. you were on the mainland uh, getting ready to, to uh, head to paradise. Yeah, and I've been here about... Almost a year now. So Has I it been a year? It's, yeah, it's been almost a year now. So I think it was a, a good move. I mean, I think the takeaway for, for people is, you know, go where you want to go. Don't worry about the money. The money will take care of itself. Now, nope, those are powerful words. Uh, kind of lifestyle as opposed to uh, go lock yourself into a, a, a job and the money kind of thing. I, right. uh, powerful words. Unless it's San Francisco. That's just places too, just too expensive. Well, yeah, and I, yeah, I mean that, that, and and uh, uh, just definitely, definitely cost of living down there. You got to adjust accordingly, I guess. Exactly. Um, hey, before we uh, talk about um, fundraising and that, uh, if you could uh, share with the listeners a little bit about your story and uh, how you got into investing. Yeah. Um kind of give the abbreviated story the guys can go back to that old podcast but I'm that uh that guy who went to school because everybody told you to go and become an engineer uh, graduated with an engineering degree went to work for a few years saved my money like like a good little boy and became an accidental landlord um, became an accidental landlord because I bought that primary residence and then I just started to rent it out on a whim because I was traveling all the time and was never home so I started to um, see what cash flow was like. I rented it out for 2200 and the mortgage was 1600 So that was in my early 20s. And, you know, I was like, shoot, I, I don't really like my job. I'm going to do this again. <laughs> so I bought another duplex in Seattle at the time. And 2012 came around and nothing cash flowed. So I tried a rental property in Birmingham, uh, one of these turnkey rentals. Tried it out. It worked. I sold the two Seattle rentals and as soon as I knew it, I had about a dozen single family homes around Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis. And that was kind of the, uh, that kind of brought me up to a few years back. And, but then I realized, you know, you do all this work to buy one single family home. You go through all the process all for what, like a measly $300 a month of cash flow, which is great. You know, cash flowing about $3,000 a month. But it's just not scalable, right? Because you're going to have, you know, for 10 properties, I was having like an eviction or two a year, maybe four big catastrophes that happened. And you multiply that by three because, you know, you need 30, 000, or, you know, you need 30 houses or $100,000 passive really to get anywhere. And you quickly realize that that's, you know, if you do the math, that's going to be about an eviction every other month. And a big attach for every month. <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't take long. I, and I, I would totally uh, concur with you. The, uh, the singles are a nice way to get started, but it's, it's, um, there's a scale ability issue if you really want to grow it and, and make it a, uh, you know, not, not just a passive income, but an actual, you know, where you've got, uh, uh plenty of money and you're, you're, um, what's the word financially free, uh, is really kind of the, I think the mantra and uh, it's kind of, it, it is doable. I know people that have done it, 
but I think you have to have a, um, a longer runway and, uh, you know, more, um, I don't know, control over what you're doing. Cause if you're subbing it out and all that kind of stuff, you, you can uh, easily eat up all your expenses and, and that, but. Right. Uh, right. And especially being like an out of state remote investor, I mean, they're just, you know, they know, they think I'm like this rich investor in Hawaii and I'm not, and I'm living in like a 600 square foot condo, smaller living quarters than my tenants actually. <laughs> right. But so they're giving me these like crazy invoices where like a plumber goes over there for like nine hours and there's like two of them to fix a little link uh, leak. And, you know, that's just the stuff that kind of goes on in single family home world. Right. Um, right. No, and that, yeah, I think again, with that, that just the ability to scale, you know, if you had, uh, if you own the whole block, uh, that might be one thing, but if you're spread out and, and whether or not your people are, you're using the same people on every everything, and if you got middlemen and all that kind of stuff, it it can uh, add up in a hurry. Exactly, so. exactly. So I mean, I went on this, um, you know, I did the math, and I was like, well, this is not the way I should go. And you know, I tell a lot of um, my guys, like the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, you know, obviously, if you make up a certain amount, it makes no sense to do single family homes. Just go straight into the big stuff. But that's the hard part, right? Because everybody kind of falls in the middle where when do you make the jump to the bigger stuff? It's, you know, kind of the question I've been pondering lately. I've got some charts and the graphs to kind of, you know, figure it out. You know, if you make this, it, I, from what I feel like it's some combination of liquidity and how much existing cash flow that you have, which kind of is indicative of how much experience you have. But when you say uh, liquidity and cash flow, are you talking about from a W2 or just a, an occupation? Are you talking about from a property or what, what do you mean? All combined. Okay. W2 and your passive income. Okay. And um, so you've uh, kind of boiled it down to where are you sharing that with uh, potential investors then, or is this just part of your educational platform or? Yeah, that's um, that I can give away that for free. That's no problem. I mean, that's just a, right now that article is sort of in draft, but um, I kind of have some thoughts that people have asked me, you know, when should I make the jump? Because like you said, single family homes, you, it, you get a much higher return, but it's, you're being the operator and you have to scale that yourself. Yeah. No, and I, I think the, the, well, and this is true, I think with all real estate, um, you know, time will, cure a lot of those issues you know in the beginning i think it's tough to get into anything uh, whether you're buying a single family or multifamily or whatever the, the difference is though i think when you get into the um uh, and i want to get into their conversation a little bit more about the syndication and you know investing more with with professionals that are doing this and and uh you know you're, you're basically getting a return as opposed to having to be actively involved in that and so maybe that's a good starting point or a good uh, transition from, you know, where you started in the single families, uh, local, and you had to look, you know, further away and you found out the challenges of scaling there and you decided, you know, multifamily might be the better, better answer. And uh, so from there, why don't you walk us through, how did you decide to, to, well, from, deciding to do multifamily and then what options you were looking at within multifamily. Yeah. And it took me a while. And I, a couple of times I regressed right back to doing my single family home thing, but you know, talking to a lot of investors like yourself, who, who's kind of made the leap. Um, and you know, they're always saying, you know, I guess it always depends who you talk to, right? Cause the single family home guys are always going to tell you single family home guys is the most, is the best thing you do. You can do the multifamily guys are always telling you about all these, you know, sort of complicated lending terms. And at the time I was like, well, that's just too complicated. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. But as I met more and more people and I got into higher and higher networking groups, it was apparent that, you know, a lot of these guys felt had a negative sentiment towards the scalability of single family homes and, and we're going to the multi. So, you know, I, I kind of just, I kind of follow what people do who, what I want to do. That's how I kind of fell into multifamily. How I ultimately made that decision. 
Sure. Well, and I think the, there's a couple things that I think get ignored in some of these conversations and, and I think are really kind of key to it. And one of which is just recognizing the amazing uh, change in, in the economies of scale and just the dynamics that are in play. I mean, you know, running up to the, um, the 07 crash, uh, money was so loose and fast and free that, you know, it was the, the, the government and the, the policies were really working to get people into homes and it overboiled and you had a lot of speculation and stuff. So there was a lot of appreciation based on the inexpensive cost of money. I mean, basically free money, right? And that, right. that, that worked well for the single family and that got, that got built out really extensively. And I, I think that, uh, you know, on, 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 not to totally beat up single family, cause I've got still a handful of them myself, but, but I think that again, uh, the way I look at it is just, if you have a long runway, uh, you, you got, there's two plays that I think are, are safe. One is you've got a declining balance. So you're going to build equity just based on having a tenant pay that down. Right. It's not a, that's not, not an aggressive play. Uh, and then you likely have some sort of a, a sense of appreciation over time. And then the, the last thing I'd say is that the, the sellability of the property, it's probably, I think you could argue, it's, it's easier to sell quicker a uh, single family property than it would be a multifamily just based on the, on, uh, you know, the, just the, the marketplace. I mean, there's a lot more buyers for single family homes than there are for multifamily properties. Yeah, you could either sell to an investor or you could sell it to a, um, you know, somebody wants to make it their home. Um, so if you, if you find a good property and a good market and you get into a right, I think that the issue that, that I found is that cash flow with single families, that, that wasn't something I experienced in the beginning. It sounds like you, you, you know, you, you were making 500 bucks on your own place right out of the chute and you're thinking like, holy moly, this is great. And that was just kind of your, that was your starting point. So you were, you were always making money, looking to make more money, which I think has always been the, the reference point for multifamily investors because they look at it more like a business and that you have to have cash flow. Does that make sense? Right, right. Yeah, and I don't want to beat up single family homes too much because I mean a lot of people call me and they're like, I heard you're the multifamily guy. I'm gonna do multifamily. I'm like, hold up, hold your horses, right? Your net worth is less than two hundred thousand dollars. You don't have any experience. Go ahead and get a few single family homes first. I mean that's how I started. And I still right. have them today, you know, granted, I'm trying to sell them all, but, and right. it, you know, a lot of, all of them are tenanted, so they, they don't really move like hotcakes that are tenanted. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, if it's working, it's, I mean, I don't know, I, I've always looked at it like it's, if, if there's a transition, take a look at the marketplace and just see what you can do and, and, um, uh, you know, but, but anyway, just, just to kind of draw the distinction there, I can, I kind of think that's. Uh, a little bit of the differences I've seen. Um, so, so let's talk about your, you, you decided to do, to do multifamily. What have you done in multifamily? What are you doing in multifamily? Yeah. So currently I, I, um, I go in as a limited partner into deals. Um, I pretty much, I'm, I'm kind of the, uh, I hunt the hunter. I don't look for deals. I look for the people who have the deals and I just go after their deals. <laughs> I, um, I joined an apartment mentoring group probably about three years ago, two, three years ago. And, you know, I, I want, I went in thinking, yeah, I'm going to be an operator, right? I'm going to go one day own a 150 unit apartment building where I'm going to find it, be a deal hunter and then go and acquire it and operate it, reposition it. Yeah. That's going to be me. Right. But then I got about 18 months into the process and about two, 300 of deals analyzed. And each time you analyze a property, it's, you know, pulling the P&Ls, the rent rolls, the rent comps, you know, a 20 minute ordeal once you get pretty good at it and nothing worked. So I don't know how these beginners are finding a deal. Uh, you know, deals aren't gone through with wholesalers. This is multifamily. This is the big boy club. They're gone through brokers and you have to have a track record to work with a broker because a broker wants a proven closer. So, you know, it helps when you work with a partner who can, you can borrow their resume and submit that along with your paperwork. But 
I, I kind of went through this process and, you know, every beginning investor goes through it where you kind of go in and you try and bid for properties or you try, even try and get deals. And it's just all junk thrown your way. Um, so I got a little discouraged and I, I realized that being, living in Seattle, trying to buy these properties in Dallas or, you know, all the way across the country, I was at a competitive disadvantage. I was not able to take brokers out to lunch every other week, nor did I really want to. So that's why I kind of switched my strategy. I kind of gave up on being an operator and I said to myself, well, I'm just going to be a limited partner. That way I don't have to analyze 200 properties. I can just analyze 20 of them a year and go in and see the best few of them. So, and I think just for our listeners, just to kind of uh, reassess and make sure everybody's on the same page and understanding. So an operator in a, in a syndication is typically the, the general partner. Is that That's correct. the syndication? And they're the ones that are, that are uh, responsible for operating the par- property, uh, raising the capital, which would be finding people like yourself, the limited partners, um, and then putting together the, um, the prospectus and, and that whole process. Um, and so w- when you were going through that process, you, you, may, you, you referenced the uh, relationship with the brokers and stuff. And so were you just, were you just basically not getting any, any opportunities that had any meat on the bones or, or was it, did you ever get to the point where you had a deal that you thought would work, but you, but you, I mean, did you ever get that far? Did you ever get anything that, yeah, I mean, out of like, you know, 300 deals analyzed, I mean, of course, probably maybe in 400 of them, because 100 of them you can just look at it and it's just, you know, they even make any sense all right off the bat. But yeah, you know, 300 of them, maybe, maybe a few of them were in LOI, but, you know, you go to best and final and it's just, then you just get blown out of the water by one of these other apartment investing groups. And, you know, that's, you don't want to be the top bidder a lot of times. Right. Right. Sometimes it's good not to win the property. Right. So can you tell us about one of the properties that you, you did get in uh, best and final? Uh, you know, I actually don't even remember it. Okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, they're all kind of the same. You don't really get into it until you're even in that, that last best and final. And, it, you know, it's just kind of so far along. I don't, even, I don't even remember the properties that I closed on. <laughs> all right. What markets were you looking in? I was looking in the Southeast area okay. because I felt like there was a lot of people looking in the Dallas triangle and granted it's a good market. But at the time I was like, well, I'm in, I'm, I'm a guy from Seattle. I'm going to have to travel anyway. Um, I want to get away from the competition and it's just a matter of like setting up shop and building connection with brokers to find the deal in a local area and to get, you know, pick, I think the key is to just pick one or two markets because in the beginning, that was my mistake. I was like, well, I'm just going to pick all my markets on my single family homes are because I've got a team there. I can help people on, on the ground. I can have people, you know, walk the property before I even put in an offer. But, um, but then I kind of focused on the, um, the Alabama state and then the Georgia state. Okay. So you, you said you did this for about 18 months. You were chasing. Yeah, I had a little chart on the wall and I was like, you know, keeping track of like trying to stay motivated, how many deals I analyzed, <laughs> you know, doing it, doing what all the, um, the good students do, but I just didn't get anywhere. It, it, it was just very dismal because I had a strict criteria of what kind of a deal I was going for that produced a certain amount of return for the passive investors and there's just nothing that even came close. Gotcha. And in the, in the uh, returns, what kind of returns were you targeting? Most times when you underwrite these deals, you, you try and look for a certain return that the passive investors are looking at. And these days the passive investors are kind of typically looking for that golden number, golden number of 80 to 100% return in five years made up of both cash flow and appreciation or force appreciation and sale at the end. So there's a lot of ways, you know, they, a lot of people won't even look at a deal unless that's what's on the, the fancy executive summary PDF. 
but you know there's a lot of levers that you can pull behind the scenes like this uh the cap rate reversion trick and you know all these ways that you can manipulate the numbers um yeah what size of properties were you looking at we were looking at 60 units to 150 units and the reason being is you know you, you go you got to get a certain size right because the whole reason you're doing this is to get that fannie mae freddie mac non-recourse debt right and that's that's the big thing so when you do that you got to get over a million dollar loan size and then you're you're of course trying to get that scalability so that's what puts you over 60 units and at the time we just didn't want to we just didn't want to bite off more than we could chew you know we didn't want to go into the 200 300 sure unit. Yeah. You say we, did you have a, a partner on the general side you were looking to, to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, there were a lot of a lot of partners um, operationally, but also, you know, key principals, guys who would who trusted what we did and would lend their ban- balance sheet should that deal arise. Okay. So you do that for a while and nothing materializes and you start to take a look at the limited partner side right because I, I did this um this quick math calculation and i was like okay i have this much amount to invest you know of course we all want the fame and glory of being a, a operator or syndicator and going after the big deal and get getting all the bounty for ourselves and and coming back to the cave with the 20 percent, 30 percent general partnership split but then I realized like, hey, if I just invest my money as a passive, making 15, 20% a year, then the question, is that enough? And the, and the answer was, yeah, I'll get there very soon. So then yeah. the other question was like, well, why the heck are you doing all this work? You know, why don't you do what you kind of, the reason you got into this first place and just go and live on the beach. Why don't, well, I moved to Hawaii and that was kind of part of the, where this uh, epiphany came from. You know, just just go move to paradise. I mean, you'll be all right. I mean, you're already making three times what most people are making in the stock market and much secure asset. Right, right. So so the um, you, you make the mind shift. You, you, you go from, I'm going to be the guy to I'm going to be a limited partner. A guy, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a guy, yeah. So tell us about uh, what criteria or what you were looking at when you chose the the general or the deal. Yeah, so on a high level, I look at the person is 50% of the deal and the numbers are fifty, the other 50%. You know, so taking a look at the person first, you know, I join a lot of um, groups, pay a lot of money for men, um, mentorship and mastermind clubs so I can specifically get in a room and build my network so that I can verify certain lead investors. I want to know who's been in the the person's previous deal and what what happened because I'm trying to verify track record and and the character. Right, right. So when you go down that, uh, are there certain things you're looking for? I mean, a, a track record, you looking for a number of deals they've done, or are you looking for, what, what have you found? Yeah, I think I just want to, I just want to hear what, what the person did. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially like in Dallas, you, you got guys doing deals there and they're just sort of a product of a good market. You know, anybody could have kind of, made money in Dallas in 2014 to 2016. Right. That was just kind of a, a booming time when rents were going up like 5%. Um, right. But I, think- I mean, a lot, I think a lot of the, the passive investors, although they're passive, the ones that have been doing it a while, they have a great wealth of knowledge and they have great insights. A lot of them have been the operator role initially. So they know, and they know who is a good lead and who's the not a good one. So kind of, getting their advice first. I think that's the big thing. And I think that's a, most people will go straight to the leads. And I think that's, you know, you want to go to the most disinterested party, which are the limited partners. Right. Now, I, I think it's, it's interesting um, when you shift your, your mindset and, you know, you start looking at it from a different angle and you go, well, wait a minute, 
Uh, and then you, 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 I mean, cause I think up to that point, it sounds like you're like, you know, most people you're, you're going through the deal spreadsheet and you're trying to find the deal, 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 uh, as opposed to just coming back to the who, you know, find the, the person that has a track record and, and, you know, nobody's bad mouth and they've, they've got the, the, the track record that speaks volumes and, and they've got the network and the, the, the systems in place. And, you know, they've got the relationships with the brokers. They've already established that. So they're getting, they're getting those deals before they're even thinking of calling you because they've already looked at them and if it was any good, they took it. Right. 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 So, <laughs> I mean, of so. course, all the, all the other leads are going to talk bad about the other leads. That's just, that's just sure. obvious. I mean, although, you know, a lot of good people, they don't do that right off the bat, but, but you want to go, you know, just like when I was looking for turnkey rentals as an investor, I wouldn't go to the turnkey provider to go get advice. That's the worst place I would go. I would go to the, the, the investors and ask them who they're using, who's their property management. Right. Same thing. Right. Right. So how far are you into uh, your limited uh, investor side of things? Um, I think me and my partner, we've got like, I know we got like 1200 units, but we're trying to close another couple of deals this month. So I think it'll be up to somewhere around 14, 1500. Wow. So, so are you in a fund then, or did you go in on specific properties or how are you? Yeah, we kind of, what we do do is like we made an LLC and we kind of invest out of the, the same thing. So a lot of the minimums for these deals are like $50,000. dollars mm hmm so, you know, if you, if you've got a good buddy and you trust, you know, now each of you can put in 25 and get into the deal as an LLC. Gotcha. So, gotcha. It just helps your money go a little bit further because I think in the beginning, most passive investors, they just want to get diverse, diversified $50,000 check, especially when it's your first deal, even if you're a million dollars net worth or above, I mean, that's a big thing. The first one is always scary, but if you can kind of, you know, bring that bear of entry down and then you can go into four or five deals. And now you're, now you're seeing, you know, different styles of different lead, leads and different areas, different asset classes. And then you can kind of get a, make a better decision instead of just poking around on the outside, you're actually inside, you know what it's like. Sure. And are you working with uh, the same operators on all these or have you found how many, op how many different uh, generals? Oh, yeah, they're all, they're all different operators. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys just got to think, I mean, these, the deals that they're doing, I mean, they're, they're probably looking at a hundred deals a year and only like five of them make sense where they put in an LOI and then one of them, they actually put under contract and take it to syndication. So, um, kind of a 1% there. Yeah. Got it. Um, so you're currently invested in 1200 units and it sounds like you, there's, uh, some others you're going to be, uh, getting into here soon. Is that, yeah, and that, that's my plan. You know, like I'm, I'm currently sold off half of my single family home. So I'm kind of doing it slowly on purpose to mm -hmm. minimize my liquidity and to, you know, I don't want to have too much money just sitting around making 0%. I get anxious when that happens. Are but you? single family homes I sell, I put into the multifamilies as they come up because the syndications, they don't come up very often. Sure. Are you doing uh 1031s out of your single families or are you just paying the tax and I'm just paying the tax and I don't really believe in the 1031 exchange. Couple, you know, a couple of reasons. First, you're going to have to pay the taxes at some point. You might as well take, pay it today sooner. You know, when, when the taxes are lower now, because I plan to make more money in the future. And then the second reason is you can't go in as, you know, it's not a like kind of exchange to go in from real estate to an LLC partnership. It's right. two different. And that's what I was kind of curious if you were, if you were able to do yeah. something with a tenancy. I've, or something I've like tried. That. I've asked yeah. a gazillion people. I've talked to yeah. so many investors. You can't do it. You, you can do a thing, what's called a tenant in common. Right. And go as a kind of a part ownership to a syndication group but nobody really wants to do that. That's just a pain. No one will want to deal with you. <laughs> right. And unless you had some monster amount that they, they needed. Uh, but yeah. But I think what's still, what's weird is like the people in the syndication will be like, okay, what's this, this other group, Darren Gross LLC. 
oh, he's staying at 1031. You know, people just get spooked by that, I think. So it's just like, and then, and then when you do your job and five years later, you're in the same predicament. So it's just like a kicking the can down the road. Right. Now, I, I think the, the, the 1031 exchange from what I've gathered, I've not done one, but I think that there, there is a, a, a unique fit when you're so low or you have more control over it. But I think if you're trying to go in, uh, you know, in syndication mode, I think it's, it's pretty uh, difficult there. Yeah, I sold my two Seattle rentals and I bought nine, the uh, two 1031s a few years back and I completely regret it. Completely oh. regret it. Well, there's one man's opinion on the 1031 way. Which just is my, you know, it's just my opinion. I, I do think it, it's a tool and it, the tool is for investors that don't really know what they're doing. They're okay buying like a lukewarm deal or a cold deal. You know, there's kind of like old money, you know, like, someone who just doesn't have access to deals and they can go into whatever deal they don't care right no i, I think if you and i've heard and i've talked to a couple of different guests on the, on the show here i i think if you have a you've identified a property you want and you're acting as you lane you're not trying to get you know you're not trying to syndicate a deal and you're trying to level up from your single family to a fourplex or a fourplex to a tenplex or a tenplex to a 20 or, you know, whatever. I think there is a, uh, a viable strategy there. And again, I would say like, like you mentioned, eventually you're going to pay the tax unless your, your, your real goal is just to build in an estate uh, and have something to pass on, you know, cause at that point you can, I mean, that, that's, that's the, the magical pill or the, you know, when all the taxes poof, it's gone because it transfers to the next generation. Okay? Right. If you don't have that as part of your plan, it shouldn't be part of your strategy. Yeah. I think the only way the, I've actually heard of a guy, I was actually on a call with him and he was telling me, you know, and, you, know you gotta love these investors. They're straight shooters, right? He says, Lane, I'm old. I'm going to die. I'm yeah. just going to give this to my, my um, offspring. And they don't know anything about real estate. I just want them to cash it out. But this is part of my plan. I'm like, cool. <laughs> But right. no, that's, you're right. That's the exact situation to use it in. Well, and that's a whole other strategy from an investor standpoint. <laughs> Look for guys like that that uh, have heirs that uh, you know don't know anything and and may not want it, right. and uh, you know are willing seller, if you will. So, so have you uh, been in these long enough? Are you are you getting? Uh, do you get monthly checks, quarterly checks? What what kind of returns have you seen? Yeah, usually it's quarterly checks, but um, you know, in the beginning, it takes it takes two to three quarters for the cash flow to start kicking in. I mean, all the capex you want to be in a deal where they raise all the capex up front, so they're not dipping into operations to pay investors. Um, right. I think when they do that, I think that's a that's fraud. I think I don't think you're allowed to dip into um, distribution or um, contributions to pay out investors. But anyway, you know, it takes a while for the, the cash reserves to build up because a lot of times, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they're 80% lien holders in the deal. So they always have, they always play a role where they're like, you can't kick out distributions yet because we want to see XX and X met. So usually it takes about, you know, I, one of my deals, you know, paid cash flow in the first quarter. It wasn't the full amount, but, you know, definitely exceeded expectations and we thought it would be in the second quarter. But, you know, in the end, it's, it's fine. You know I mean? Kind of once it once it goes like a full year, then you're kind of humming along in third fourth gear. Right. How often are the uh, uh, the general partners or the sponsors having um, are there calls or is there or are they sending out uh, statements? What are what are you seeing? What kind of communication are you getting from the sponsors? Yeah, and then that's that's the thing. Like it's all different, right? <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, and some properties are pretty boring. Some are more things are happening. Um, I think what's normal is like a monthly email sent on about the right, t the same time of the month with some, you know, PDFs of some bank statements and some, um, income reports. That's kind of, that's quite the norm. I hear of people doing like conference calls, but you know, I mean, if you're like most limited partners, I mean, man, you're, you're probably in about a dozen deals. I mean, I can get pretty busy. Right. I mean, you know, it's always the newer guys that actually give a rip about the monthly port report. The rest guys are just scrolling down to the summary and seeing how much 
to expect in their bank account that next quarter, or how things are going. Right. right. Can you, can you uh, uh, describe like a, a range of the, the different deals you've gotten into as far as like the size of the opportunity and, and the capital raise just to give some sort of a sense of perspective? Yeah, so I, I've I've done a deal where I was actually in a general partnership for this one. It was you know I I co-sponsored. It was a fifty-two unit in Des Moines. Um, that one was like a three million dollar property, a one point one million dollar raise. So I don't know how many investors there were on that one, about twenty or so. Um, but you know the biggest one was like a two hundred fifty-three unit. I think the raise was like eight nine million. So that was a lot bigger. Whereabouts is that located? Southeast or was that? San Antonio. San Antonio? Yeah. Gotcha. Well, interesting. So you, you've made the, the shift. You thought you wanted to be the guy. Now you're a guy. A and guy. It's like, yeah, it sounds like yeah. it's working for you. Um, what, what would you say to uh, listeners that are, uh, you know, kind of in a similar state. They've, they've thought about being the general partner. They've been studying. They've been, you know, trying to find deals. They're starting to get frustrated. Uh, do you have any words of encouragement for people to, uh, to consider? The well, I mean, I mean, it, the, the, the pass rate is very low. I mean, if not, everybody would be doing it, which it kind of seems like a little bit these days. But I would, I would take a look at what you have to work with. What you, are you even living in the area? Are you some Californian that thinks you can buy properties and be the boots in the ground in Texas? I, I don't think so. There's just too many people down there. I don't invest in a deal unless the guy's boots on the ground. That's a big strike for me. Um, yeah, I, I think, and then I think you need to do the math and ask yourself, what kind of trajectory am I, am I on? You know, do you have current investments and what will they grow at what pace? And if you did switch to a limited partner role, what, where would you be financially and what kind of lifestyle would you design? Does that, does that allow you to move to Hawaii and take a pay cut? You know, does that allow you to quit your job? If, if so, maybe like that was all she wrote for you. You know, why take on extra? I mean, this is like about saying no instead of taking on more things at some point. No, that that's, uh, those are some, um, uh... Great ideas. I think they get lost a lot of time with based on uh, the consumption. Right. But I get it. I mean, I get it. You know, you listen to the podcast, you're like, you know, you get the ego thing. It's like, yeah, I want to be the guy. Right. Uh, (laughs) Right, 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 right. Yeah. You don't uh, want to be just not, not everybody just sets out to be a guy, but here you're, you're here to say that it's not so bad being a guy as opposed to being that guy. Right. Right. That's, I love it. Hey, Lane, I've enjoyed our, uh, our talk today. Is there any um, parting words you'd like to share with the listeners as to um, you know, something we didn't cover? Or? No, no. I mean, um, I mean, I've kind of fallen into, you know, helping people get into deals as a, you know, kind of general partner. I mean, people kind of like what I do in terms of like underwriting the deal. So, um, yeah, always looking to help out other investors. You know, if you're kind of in that middle ground, thinking if you should make the jump. I mean, I mean, some people, I feel like they like to do the burst strategy that buy rent rehab repair and just, I w- and I would say, yeah, keep doing that because it's what you enjoy. Right. And it's what I tell a lot of people is like, you're going to be financially free in like three to seven years by doing this. You might as well do something you enjoy. Right. right? Don't be an apartment lead just for the money. That's dumb. Right. No, I, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> That's uh, well said. Hey, wh- where can the listeners go to find out more and connect with you? Yeah, they can go to my website and listen to my podcast, Simple Passive Cashflow. And then you know, my email is lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. I'm just looking to connect. Got it. Well, Lane, uh, thanks again for taking the time to talk today. I've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll have to do it again soon. Yeah, thanks, Darren. All right. For our listeners, if you like the episode, uh, we would love to hear the, or see your like, share, and, and don't forget to subscribe. And uh, remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.